observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Uh, this was in the Washington Post. I know people are going to be like, oh, you know, I, I, I look around. I look at every place. I go to the Drudge Report. I go to the BBC. I go to uh, CNN. I go to everywhere to look for articles. I, I do. Uh, but yes, Washington Post, be prepared to say goodbye to movie theaters. This is an op-ed piece written by Megan McArdle today. It was published today at 5 a.m. No one warned me when I married a movie critic I'd almost never see a movie in the theater again. My spouse, you see, would have already attended the screening, which would take place at 10 in the morning or forbid guests or happen an hour away in the suburbs. The other thing that no one warned me about, understandably, is that during a pandemic I would be watching my beloved cinephile endure first withdrawal and then intense grief at the sudden cessation of one of his most loved activities. Man, I was reading this and it totally like hit me hard. I haven't been in a movie theater. I mean, yes, we did go to see New Mutants at the drive-in. We went to the New Mutants experience at the Rose Bowl, which was actually pretty fun. I really enjoyed it. I wish the movie was. I wish I enjoyed the movie a little bit more. Um, Mr. Boone, I'm pulling for him because man, he's directing The Stand. And for those of you, you know, you might know The Stand's one of my favorite books I've ever read. Um, don't fuck it up. And I have a lot of affection for Mick Garris's. Uh, miniseries, even though it was low budge and the first episode is probably the best, but still a lot of love for it. I mean, many of you know that for years, my friends Gary and, Gedman, uh, Gary and Edmund Enton and their father Alvin and mother Lois and brother Seth, we used to play Cast the Stand. That was, we'd get together when uh, Lois and Alvin were in town, we would go to the smokehouse for dinner and half that dinner was taken up with our game Cast the Stand, meaning who would we cast in various roles in the Stand miniseries or the Stand movie that they were going to make. And of course, well, that was curtailed when CBS All Access announced that they are indeed making the Stand. So I have to say, um, one, I'm, one of my most eagerly awaited pieces of entertainment this year is the adaptation of the Stand. And I'm only hoping there's a couple of things. I'll tell you right off the bat. I'm, there better be a really good rendition of Baby, you got to dig your... Baby, you, can you dig your man? Dig your man. Can you dig your man? I mean... Baby, Can You Dig Your Man is a really important part of The Stand. And if you don't know what that is, you should read the book or wait, and perhaps you'll hear it. It is Larry Underwood, one of the characters, Larry Underwood's hit song. Now, Mick Garris's miniseries did give us a version of Baby, Can You Dig Your Man? And uh, you can hear it on YouTube. I, I wasn't down with it. Uh, I, you know, um, I, I was hoping it'd be a little bit more kind of uh, smoky and funky or whatever, but hopefully we'll see. Um, I think I think they're going to nail it this time, but it's a big, you know, isn't it weird that one of the things I'm most eagerly awaiting is this year is to hear a fictional song? <laughs> you know, I mean, anybody who's read The Stand, Baby Can You Dig Your Man is a big deal. So, I mean, if they don't give us that, I mean, there's going to be hell to pay. I expect a good version of Baby Can You Dig Your Man. And by the way, if they were really cool, they would release that song in, 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 in the whole song. Hopefully it was recorded. I, they should put it out on Spotify as a promotion for the movie. Because anybody who's read the book, everybody who knows The Stand, knows what Baby Can You Dig Your Man is. And they should release it, and it should be great. So we'll see. Um, very excited to see it. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, so I haven't been to a movie in the theater in, since February. I have not driven to see Tenet. Elizabeth is still uh, very paranoid about going into the movie theaters. And I, you know, I can't blame her. For that, but I certainly want to go. I haven't seen Tenet yet, and people are telling me it's coming out on physical media, 4K in December. <sighs> oh well. Anyway, um, so I paid close attention as studios groped for a pandemic strategy, and now as studio after studio announces that they're pushing major new releases back, some well into 2021, it's becoming increasingly likely that Americans won't see any more blockbuster movies anywhere until most of the population has been vaccinated. Well, you know, there are there are certain things that are kind of, uh, that's true, but what I love about certain things is people are sending me their movies. I'm going to have the director of this movie, The Wretched, one of the top grossing films this summer, 
on the show coming up as a live guest. Looking forward to that. So we are getting great physical media. Physical media has been, they've been crushing it, whether you're getting 4K versions of Vertigo. I mean, the physical media is off the charts. Dawn of the Dead's finally going to be shipping that beautiful, beautiful box set. But anyway, uh, it's becoming increasingly likely that Americans won't see any more blockbuster movies anywhere until most of the population has been vaccinated. Early on, two outcomes seem possible. That COVID-19 might accelerate the already underway shift toward video on demand, and that studio films might release on schedule to our televisions while most theaters close for good. Disney's decision to release Mulan as a $30 add-on purchase for subscribers to its new Disney Plus streaming service looked like it might be the first domino that would topple all of the other blockbusters into a straight-to-video world. But it also seemed possible that, with bars and music venues closed, COVID-19 might bring us back to the future, to an old-fashioned kind of movie watching where movies open to smaller audiences then played in theaters longer, earning back their investment over weeks and months. The release of Christopher Nolan's time-bending thriller Tenet was a bet on that second proposition. It didn't work. Didn't work. Now that studios are announcing yet more delays for major franchise films such as Black Widow and Wonder Woman 1984, it looks as if both of these theories were wrong. Instead, studios are going to hit the pause button and hope that when this cruel pandemic is over, they can go back to business as usual. That was probably their only remaining option. Tenet deeply underperformed in the United States, and though it did better in the foreign territories where it played, it looks increasingly unlikely to hit the minimum $400 million in global box office it would need to earn back its investment. With the U.S. epidemic still grinding on, indeed, its cases are going up. Who wants to gamble $200 million plus investment on having better luck than Christopher Nolan? Uh, nobody. As for video on demand, while Disney has been cagey with numbers, it seems uh, reasonable to infer that if Mulan had made anything approaching traditional blockbuster profits, it would be pushing other movies out on streaming rather than moving Black Widow back to May 2021 and the rest of the Marvel Comics slate sometime after. However, we should assume that whatever the studios write on the calendar, the actual release date of any major motion picture is not a day but a hope when the pandemic is over. That's the only point at which they can be sure of making their money back. And given resurgent outbreaks in already hard-hit cities and communities, it still looks as if over will probably come through mass vaccination, not natural herd immunity. Let's, I don't mean to be depressing, but there's never been a vaccine for a coronavirus. Um, why they think they're going to get a vaccine for this one. I mean, I hope they will. That's 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 good. But um, don't know what to say about that. Which leaves us with two open questions. First, how long will it take to get enough people vaccinated so that we can once again blithely sit down in the dark with a bunch of strangers who are probably pulling down their masks to munch popcorn? In the United States, at least, the numbers keep getting more discouraging. Fewer than 40% of Americans say they'll get a vaccine when it's available, a decline that seems to be driven by partisan fear as much as medical uncertainty. The longer it takes, the more urgent becomes the second question. Will theaters still be around when viewers are ready to go back? Theater chains are already facing a debt crisis that will become dire if they have to go another year without any significant revenue, as are the shopping malls where many of those theaters are housed. The modern movie business has been turned to operate at a vast scale, opening mega-budget blockbusters on thousands of screens at once. It's unclear what happens if a significant portion of that capacity simply vanishes in the course of a year or two. A lot of things are closing, sometimes for good. We heard I heard Sizzler. Not that, you know, as I get older and have my one foot in the grave, do I go to Sizzler much. But you know what? Every couple of years... Uh, Already the soup plantation, that's gone, right? And uh, Sizzler's d disappearing. I mean, maybe these things will all come back, but, I mean, living in L.A., all you do is see everything you love clothes. I mean, the co Coach and Horses is gone. Cat and the Fiddle's gone. Lola's is gone. These are all bars. Timmy Nolan's was taken from us. It's depressing, man. Depressing. Um... Yet even these financial problems are probably secondary to the behavioral one. If it takes 18 months or even longer for enough Americans to get vaccinated, could Americans simply lose the habit of going to the movies, learning to get their video entertainment from streaming series, and their socializing from the backyard? Any one of these changes, financial or behavioral, would utterly upend the movie industry as we know it. But put the two together, and we have to at least consider the possibility that many Americans like me will almost never see a movie in the theater again. Now, I don't mean to, you know, I don't mean to make this like the most depressing thing in the world, um, but it is a very real possibility. 
And as we all know, studios want to, I mean, physical media is already dying and studios want, they would much rather, I think, not release movies in theaters if they didn't have to. Now, the thing is, when you're making movies that cost $200 million, a theatrical run is, is pretty much key to a movie studio. But what's interesting is Netflix, they announced they're making a $200 million action movie with the Russo brothers. Now, I don't really understand the economics behind that. I mean, you know, I, I honestly don't understand how there are certain shows on Netflix that they'll cancel after one season or two seasons, and yet they'll make a $200 million movie. Because the thing is, on Netflix, to me, it's the great democratizer of content. You look at stuff on Netflix. Now, sure, we don't get their analytics, and I'm sure there's so much stuff on Netflix that might get a few views as opposed to, say, um, hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of millions of views. So there's a lot. I'm sure there's a huge disparity between the most watched show on Netflix and the most unloved show on Netflix. A huge disparity. But they all look the same when you're clicking through. You don't know. You don't know which show is more successful than the other. It's all just kind of the same content. I mean, Netflix to me is the great democratizer. And unless you look at like the top 10 things that are trending, which I've loved, I've loved that Netflix is putting these things there. It just, it bummed me out, man. It's, it, it, you know, I, I hark back to, and I don't remember when he said this, but during the dawn of the home video era, when I started working in video stores when I was 13, I always remember that article I read somewhere, and I don't know where it was. Maybe it was in Starlog, maybe it was in like Time Magazine, but Kubrick, Kubrick, I have Kubrick on the brain. Um, uh, um, Steven Spielberg said that the blood, sweat, and tears that he put into making Close Encounters, to see that fit in a cassette that fit in the palm of his hand was more than a little disconcerting. That's not an exact quote, but the, the gist of it was... You know, he he didn't like it. And and back in the day, people forget about this. I mean, a lot of you who maybe are watching this weren't even born yet. But during the early 80s, when home video was exploding, everybody thought that movies were going to go away. The theatrical experience was going to go away. That people wouldn't want to go to the movie theaters anymore. Well, I could tell you, and I was saying this to anybody who would listen, I thought just the opposite was true. Because for me, as a burgeoning movie fan and movie scholar, um, home video allowed me to watch movies over and over. It allowed me to tape movies off television, late night TV that my parents wouldn't let me stay up and watch. So suddenly I could get my hands on those things. It allowed people to really start studying movies. And not only that, it made people more of a fan of films. I think people started going to the movies more. Now, I don't have any data, but home video to me, in my mind, what it did was it turned everybody into... Movie fanatics, you know, and I think that was a pretty, a pretty cool thing to have happen. I mean, everybody became a, a movie nut, and that's what home video did. And now we're facing a situation and uh, this pandemic where, uh, look, I don't want one of the great pleasures in my life because I'm a movie fanat fanatic is going to the theater. I love the ritual of it. I love sitting there, but most of all, I love seeing the imagery on a big screen with a loud sound system. I mean, I've, I've banged on and on about how the last time I saw Blade Runner 2049 in IMAX, I was there in the theater almost by myself on a Tuesday afternoon on Hollywood Boulevard at the Chinese. It was a transcendent, it was a religious experience because the volume was so loud, the laser projection is so sharp, and the sound mix of that movie, I mean, I understand it's a particular kind of film, but that's one of the best sound mixes I have ever heard in my life. And, and hearing it, it was just astonishing and you could never even with the best home theater system and i've seen some pretty incredible home theater systems here in la it you would be hard pressed to recreate the experience of seeing blade runner 2049 in imax at the chinese theater unless you went to an imax screen that was bigger but the sound was just it was truly outstanding so i'm i'm really pulling for movie theaters i hope i hope that they're going to stick around but I don't know. I honestly don't. I don't know. It just, the whole thing makes me sad. But I hope we get him back. Now, 